this is Jack McClanahan, Jack Mac, and having a long anticipated conversation with Bill Hendrick, one of my heroes. <laughs> that really, Bill, I'm I'm serious in that. You know, mine too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank Ernie you. Binko here. He's going to help us out. He's doing the filming. There's just so much that I think we need to find out some of the answers to questions, and you could tell us some stories that are fill in the blanks on those stories around our area. Yeah. We're just talking. Bill was born 1928 in Norton, Park Avenue Hospital. Do you remember the doctor that delivered you? Who was that? Dr. Faust. Faust. Very good. Now, at that one time, there was the three hospitals in Norton, St. Mary's right. and Community, and then Park Avenue. Park Avenue, right. right. Then, and I was the president of all three. Really? <laughs> you were the head daddy rabbit of them, huh? <laughs> That's great. Not at the same time. Well, no, that'd be a little overload. Yeah. But no, I, you know, all my days I think of you as being one of the great pillars of our community and Norton and the whole region. Uh -huh. that, uh, well, I can't remember I a back. time when you weren't part of it. I go back a long way. Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah. You know, one of the things that sticks in my memory was uh, uh, Hainam Lake, and I was, I stood on the spot in the lake before it became a lake. Really? Yeah. Well, now, I remember hearing a story about them building the beach up there. And, and that sort of thing. Yeah. That was a lot of sand to be hauled up there. And I can't imagine the truck being too big that was a haul in it. Yeah. That, uh, it, it was on uh, the N and uh, W. Really? They helped out in putting that up there? Yeah. Well, they hauled it. Well, that was Norton. And more, then, there was a lot of people that volunteered their time to get that done. It must have been a good relationship with the National Forest, or was that before the National Forest took it over up there? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking that was, uh, and was that in the late 40s, Ernie, when they divided, uh, built the Norton, or the High Knob Lake and the beach? I was thinking after World War Two, when they, they got in there and started building that. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, quite a spot for recreation. Didn't have much other beach or property around anywhere. No, no. Were you in on the crusade that started all of that, or were you just one of the many helpers that got them going on it? Probably both. Okay. Yeah, you started out being working in the community early on, I know. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that 19, helped. 1928. Yeah. Well, it was a day or two after that before you started going up on the knob. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but we, uh, when you were up at the uh, Schoolhouse Museum a month or so ago, Diane, your daughter, brought up a document about a proposal for a Appalachian National Park being on High Knob. None of us ever had ever heard of that. Now somehow you had come to possess that application or proposal. Who, who started all of that and what was the intent of it? Do you remember any of that? Uh... No, we just, none of us had ever, ever even dreamed of such a thing. Well, what a difference that would have made if that had ended up being a park, not on the magnitude of, say, the Smokies, but still that would have been a, a, a big boost to our area. 
that uh, I don't know how big a proposal it would have been. That uh, well, these were these were infant days. Yeah, yeah. Well, it uh, high knob. We're working on a thing up there now. I'm with Spearhead Trails, it's developing trails around. And one of the things that came up was Thunderstruck. And what? Thunderstruck was an old name for the High Knob area. And I just wondered if you knew anything about the origin of that term. No. That, that had been around for a long time. It may have gone back to the early settlers crossing through there. But there's so much history involved with all of that. Chief Binge and the a little bit of controversy over where he was actually captured or gone down. What do you feel like was the place that Binge was, his demise was met? It depends on who you're talking to. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, I, I've heard so many different versions of that. That uh, the Binge's Rock, a little ways up the mountain, there's one version. That's that, right. Benji's Rock as you're going up the mountain up there yeah. above the Legion Park and all. I've always felt like that, that was one version. Is that the way you understood it, Ernie? Uh, I understood that they went through the holla going towards... Hoodow Holla. Yeah, Hoodow Holla and then turn right and come down by those big columns. It went on to Appalachia that way. And if you start looking over on the St. Paul, on the Howe Valley, who would want to climb down that that day and time? Yeah. It'd be better walking down by the creek or the river. Uh -huh. That's what I think. Now yeah. that that column, as you speak of, that uh, behind old uh, the Teasley home, there's a pile of rocks up there stacked up about 40 feet high. Did you ever go up and see those rocks? That, you can't even see them now. The trees have taken them over so much. But it's a, that column, does it have a name that you're aware of? No, not that I know, but the uh, the people that owned that before the, the Teasley's was the uh, Curry's. Same people had de started D. Curry's department store. Okay. And the Curry's had that property. And they're supposed to be riding or some something on those columns. I've, I've heard that too. I've never been over there to them. Petroglyphs or something yeah. on that. But, uh, yeah, I've always heard about them, but I've never... About what? Petroglyphs. Uh, early drawings from Indians or uh, on the back side of that rock. Yeah. That paintings and things of that nature. I think so. Where they're stacked up. Yeah. It almost looks like it's man-made or they've been stacked up in there. That uh, that had to be a tremendous mile post for the people traveling through to reach your destination or whatever. Uh, well, we uh, we were always told that Chief Benz is the, the one that made that saddle. Oh, really? Yeah. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> that uh, he was quite a character. And feared by many. Yeah. yeah. That uh, I've been uh, with Doc Fleener a lot lately, and all the books that he's written, and I don't know how in the world he ever had time to practice the <laughs> physician and all the work that he's put into his books. But it's fascinating all of these names and how that uh, the first settlers to come through their area. That was long before any of us were ever around, but it laid the groundwork for what we have today. Now, I've always heard Norton was Prince's Flats. How did the name Prince get involved with all of that? Uh, it seems to me like it was... Uh, uh, one of the early settlers named Prince. I was thinking maybe with the railroad I, I, uh, <clears throat> coming in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 
and they uh, they called it Princess Fats for a while. Yeah, yeah. After that. Before Norton became yeah. a, a factor. But another thing, though, is most of the people that came over towards Norton came over from the Scott County side, right. and they lived in the hollow up there towards going up High Knob. Yeah. Norton was a swamp. Nobody came to Norton <laughs> until the railroads came in and they drained the swamp. And they, when, when hence the, Francis Flats is that yeah they had to wonder who. That had to be an awful lot of hand digging to get that drained in there, the ditching and all. Yeah. Is uh, Dr. Cox used to be from Norton, and he was his family came over from Scott County. Yeah, there at uh, Fort Blackmore, the Cox's home place is right there next to where the fort was. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there was Cox's at that fort. Uh, Another one of the names that goes way back that came in. The Hendrick family is from Clinchfield. Coopers? Clinchfield. I mean, what is it? Clint, what, where is it that you were, where Granny and Pop lived? Where Granny was born? Where was, where was your mother born? Raised? Castlewood. Castlewood. I said, Boy, sorry. now that was. Got the wrong. So Castlewood was really the hub there for quite quite a few years. Uh, I remember Doc Fleener talking about twice, if not as many as five times, when Boonesboro was under siege, they sent runners back to Castlewood for help. And they'd send several at a time, you know, as many as they could spare, not knowing if any of them were going to make it. And two of them, had made it all the way to the fort there at Castlewood and one of them was beating on the door to get in and he was shot in the back with an arrow. He made it right there to it but didn't get there. And that, you, I can't imagine how that would have been. You know, they were running as fast as they could. Boonesboro, 200 miles from here. I know. <laughs> and going through the woods and knowing that there was somebody behind it potentially ready to kill you. And, had to carry that rifle and what little bit of food you could pack. Gunpowder. Yeah. And those old slick soul moccasins, how in the world they made it. I, I, it just amazes me. And then they get the militia, and the militia would get back up there in less than three or four days. And that, I don't know how they could have traveled that far or that fast. And, and there wasn't any mile markers or signposts that they had to read the signs and it, it just, I truly find it amazing how we got through all of that. Well, it's a question of, I tell the tale as it's told to me. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. Now some of it would have been documented that, uh, yeah. uh, like the Scots, family that uh, they settled over Marlins Creek and it was Chief Binge that uh, got a hold of them uh, and uh, she was killed. I think he was too, but, but uh, Fanny, I think it was Fanny Scott, but uh, and they must have been some of them settling over in here. Now before, do you know where your mother was uh, or where her family came into Castlewood, how did they? Russell, Russell, Russell County. Okay, is that about as far back as you have them yeah. track? Okay. His mother was a Cooper, and there were tons of Coopers over there oh, at yeah. one time. I don't know if there still are. Well, they've scattered now. They're not. Uh, you look through these different records, like I say, that, that Doc's got, that uh, he, he had done a lot of research on different ones. He must have had to go up to Richmond and get in the archives to find a lot of the, this stuff. Uh, Doc Fleeter, when he was making his books and getting all of that together. Uh, there was something that I came across here all about 10 years ago that I'd never heard of. Over across from the police department in Norton, where the Coca-Cola plant was. Right. On one of the manhole covers, 
steel manhole cover. It had Norton foundry and wheel on it. Do you know, remember anything about what was of the what? Norton foundry, where they cast the metal and that sort of thing for wheels? Do you remember anything of that? I just remember what it said. But you don't remember the foundry in no. itself? I don't, I don't even know where it would have been or anything. Ernie, are you familiar with it? No, I'm That's not. That's the first time I'd ever heard of it. That uh, must have been making wheels for the railroad. And, uh, but that's a very special manhole cover uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we need to find out about those things. I remember, it seems to me like I remember seeing that manhole cover thing. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I just wondered where the founder was. Somebody I was talking to, and I have no verification of it, thought it was over there, uh, what do they call it? Round Hill or Round the Top, uh, over above Wyandotte, there in uh, Norton. Uh, said it was in that area where the Coal Temple is, uh, Lowdown. Uh, I thought you might have heard something or remembered something of the structure that all this effort for going to the steel and that sort of thing. I, we think of it as big stone, but apparently there must have been something going on in Norton in those early years. Now, I understand there's two houses up there that had coal mines in them. Were you aware of the coal mines in the basement yeah. of the houses? Whose houses were those? Lord, I'm heard. Was that uh, Senator Long's family? I understood that they had the house up there with uh, Judge Bandy. Bandy, okay. Had a Henry Bandy. Yeah. They had a coal mine in his house and they had carts in there. I always thought of them as much like Indiana Jones carts that they had pushing that coal out and putting it in the furnace. Yeah, they're still in there. They're in the basement of the house? Yeah. That's wonderful. So that needs to be saved or <laughs> documented. I know where they mined out there was a big tree behind the house that uh, where it had been mined out it shifted and the tree fell from the massiveness of it. They were worried that they were going to, it was going to damage the house. And uh, there was another house somewhere on the hill that had a mine under it, but I don't know which one that was. Uh, that's going way back. Yeah. The, the miners and all that. None of that was documented and mapped in those early days very no. well. But there is an article in a uh, 1918 magazine about Henry's Henry Bandy's house with a coal mine in. Have you got it, or have you got it documented? I know where it's at. Oh, that's good. That uh, you know, tell people about that now. It doesn't seem it could have ever been possible. I remember hearing the story when they were burying the cable there in Norton. Uh, well, it was Super Service behind Norton Hotel, burying the cable for the telephone. And it was one of those early uh, excavators are digging, and he was down deep burying that cable. He said, I've dug up a fence post. <laughs> it wasn't a fence post, it was mining timber. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you remember that, that that happening up there when they were putting that? No. That, uh, <clears throat> well, there was, must have been a lot of mining going on after they drained the swamp because yeah, that would have been wet right through there. Well, they used a lot of timbers in the swamp so they could have roads over top of the timbers. Kind of, did they lay them flat? Or? Yeah. Okay. It's amazing what our forefathers went through to get this towns and everything established. That uh, the other day I was down here at the uh, visitor center at uh, in Big Stone, and Suge Hall, who was, you know, hosting the visitor center, said he had had a phone call with somebody out of La Follette, Tennessee, asking about, said John Fox had laid out the streets in uh, La Follette. And I said, I don't think it would have been John, it could have been his brother, 
that uh, the engineer that could have done that, that uh, well, laid them out. But now his brother was in on the survey in a big stone. You're you're sitting in the house. Horace. Horace Fox. This was Horace's house? This, this was Horace Fox's house. Well, what year was it built? Do you have any idea? 1896. Wow. 1896. Yeah. And it's actually. It's, it's a historical house. Oh, well, it's been more ways than one. Yeah. <laughs> Current resident included. Uh, <laughs> There have only been three residents, the Hendricks, the Foxes, and the last name was Smith, and I don't know much, that's who they bought it from. I wonder what Smith that would have been. I can't remember. What year did they all move in? Uh, 67? 67. Quite a span. 67, 68. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's amazing. But the, the woodwork and all the, the structure of the house is so beautiful and such wonderful work. And you think that that all had to be hand done. There was no electricity at that time. And how did they keep the, get it all sanded? I know our house was built between 24 and 26. They moved in in 26. And they had to wait three years to get electricity out there. Uh, and I've still got the sanding block that they used to sand the wood with. Yeah. Down there. And I so treasure stuff like that. Uh, but the craftsmanship that they had here, and you know, of course the, the museum I guess is one of the most uh, prominent examples of the craftsmanship, stonework and all. But you were 67, but you had been with the newspaper a while before you came down here, right? Yeah. And you started out at the coal field? And it was your background in journalism when you were at school? Yeah. You came home to... <clears throat> Get us all informed. From, from Lexington. How'd you go back and forth to school? Ride the train? Hitchhiking. <laughs> it might have been a while but between cars. i tell you what. I look back on those days and I, I'm thinking, I wouldn't any more attempt that now than the man in the <laughs> Well, it's a different world then. Oh, yeah. But... <clears throat> It's, it's funny, um, what was her name? From Lynchburg. Lynchburg? Oh, you're talking about Barbara Polly? Uh, Are you thinking about Barbara Polly? Well, she was from Lynchburg. No, I'm thinking about me. Okay. Dad went to college for a year in Lynchburg. Oh, really? His freshman year. And then he transferred over to UK for a year. And then he, had, he joined the Air Force because of, partly because of the draft. And he yeah, yeah, yeah. And joined the Air Force instead of having to go to Korea. That's right. And so that's. He did his four years, then he came back and went back to Kentucky and finished his degree in Kentucky. And then when you finished your degree in, at UK, you came back here and started working at, with the coal field at that time? Yeah. So essentially you just had one job all your years. I know. That's pretty remarkable. <laughs> wow. Uh, what was the first story that you covered, a big story? I was a pioneer. Well, yes, <laughs> sure was. That, uh, do you remember what one of the big first stories you got involved with? 
The first story? Yeah, the first story that you had to write about. I know popping into my mind. Well, I can, yeah, that, that that whole thing up there, that's been such a yeah. center point for all of us. Dad, can you, do you remember about Gary Francis Powers? Oh, yeah. Maybe you could tell Jack a little bit about your... Yeah, you were right in the middle of all of the documentation. We had a lot of other reporters in here at that time, too, I bet. Oh my lord. It's unbelievable. Were, did you meet many of them or did y'all have much involvement with one another? Yeah. I, guess, I guess they were asking you where they could get a bite to eat or <laughs> that, uh, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And Oliver, uh, he had a sh shoe shop on. Uh, I see. Six Is on Park Avenue? Sixth Street. Six, Six, yeah. Sixth Street. Yeah. Is that his father? Yeah. Hmm. But that now these reporters they need them shoes repaired back there. I tell you what. Mm -hmm. I guess was that bad. it was so bad Gary's okay. that I quit taking phone calls. Really? Because they they quoted me in the early beginnings on that thing. And so everybody, this was back in the old reporter days. Right. And this, and so my, a lot of my it, mother was a telephone operator. Oh, okay. All right. And then they just up the phone and say, Apple? Get me so-and-so. See if you can find Bill. Bill I always hated that guy. Uh, <laughs> when you get stuck, when you're little, those E's come pretty quick. Uh, that, yeah, I, re I remember going through that myself. They left uh, all those reporters and and I left them left a bad taste in our mouth. Well, did they kind of talk down to you, yeah. thinking you were a barefoot, ignorant hillbilly and uh, that sort of thing? Well, I, they might have. <laughs> but, Do you remember one of the, any of the more famous names that uh, I've, uh, Edward R. Murrah, I guess, was still on the radio at that time. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Walter Cronkite, did any of them ever talk to you? Uh, on the phone. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I can remember that in those days, we had television. It wasn't, I think that uh, Huntley and Brinkley came on. They had a 15-minute program, and we had about a 15-minute local news that... Uh, that was a big story, though. Did you know, we get, I guess you got to meet Gary's family and all of that during all of that. Oh, Lord, yeah. Did they, did they talk to you as kind of a buffer between the family and the other reporters away from here, or did you were kind of a conduit for the news about the Powers family? How is that? Charlie Daniels. Charlie? Yeah. Lord, he, he, he was involved with all of that yeah. too? Look, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. He was into everything, wasn't he? That, uh, and Carl McAfee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Carl, that, that was getting his start on that yeah. in those days. There was a movie that came out a few years ago, Tom Hanks, about all this. It was called Bridge of Spies. I don't know if you saw that or not. But it didn't deal much with uh, the uh, Carl McAfee version of it. He was more for the family, a uh, lawyer with the family, but this is... He was the... Yeah, the representative them. Yeah. But uh, it was interesting bringing all that back, back up. Do you remember when he came home? 
Did you get to interview him or anything when he got home? When Gary got home? Yeah. What was that like? Exciting. <laughs> I doubt for me, I was in uh, school up here, what was the, uh, it was in the primary building, you know, the oldest of the three buildings in Big Stone. And apparently he had come in, come home at Tri-City Airport. And they had us all get out there on the fire escape and wave at him when he went by going home, coming in that way. And that was my, my extent of yeah. that. Uh, I remember when the uh, Austin powder plant blew up and the, all of that shook everybody, broke windows and everything else, Norton and Pound. And some people thought it was Russia setting off the bomb. Uh -huh. uh, just a wild, wild, wild tale. Yeah, well, I mean, when you're living something like that, you don't know until after the fact it all sounded funny, but it wasn't funny when you're going into it. No. I, uh, my dad was coming home from Wise that evening. Of course, he was coming down from Norton to Appalachia around that way, and he was right there about the bridge in West Norton when that thing blew up, and he said it felt like the concussion of it shifted the car over another lane, but nobody knew what was going on. The, the, all the windows broken and all of that. That was a you know, scary time. Everything comes back to communication. Yes. Passed along from one person to another, and it became a little tall tale. Oh yeah, it gets a little bigger every time. Yeah. Well, I bet your mother, had been an operator, that phone was, she was busy that evening. And the, the operators knew everything was going on. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Let me tell you something else about Francis Gary Powers. Uh, Francis Gary Powers' dad had a shoe shop on 6th Street. Yeah. Carl McPhee and Hugh Klein had a law office above the shoe shop. And that's how they knew each other. Carl would come in and they just wave at each other. That, that was about it. And then when this happened to Francis Gary Powers, that was the attorney that he knew, that Francis Gary Powers' dad knew, because they just wave at each other. And that's how Carl got involved with that. Also, is that when they rent that bus that went to Russia yeah. for the trial, is... Uh, Daniels, Charlie Daniels, had the International Lions Club pay for that. There wasn't anybody else had any money that would pay for that. So that was on the International Lions Club paid for that. And then after Francis Gary Powers got convicted, is uh, his dad, Francis Gary Powers' dad, said, can't we make some kind of deal to get this guy out of prison in Florida that's a Russian spy for my son. And Carl said, you're talking about heavy duty stuff here. I don't know, I haven't been involved with it, but I'll check it out. He's the one that got that done, Carl Maxwell. The federal government didn't have a damn thing to do with it. So it, it, it was Carl that was, what was the guy's name, Abel, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, that sounds right, yeah. That, uh, and you were covering all this, so a lot of this was in the paper at the time, right? Yeah. Were, were these out-of-town out reporters getting, the, getting your paper, of course, uh, having it mailed to them, to, or were they just coming to you directly to find out about Most it? Most of them came directly. Huh. But it was like, uh, and thousands of phone calls. Mm. Yeah, we, it put us on the spotlight for quite a while there, wasn't it? You know, and now it's so removed from our current knowledge. Young people have no idea anything about Gary Powers or what, what all happened. As I remember it, uh, the U-2 was obviously a spy plane. But it flew somewhere around a hundred thousand feet, wasn't it? Something up that way yeah. up there. 
and the thought was that the Russians had no capability of shooting it down. They didn't have a missile that would be that high. Yeah. They were badly fooled. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, Gary survived obviously the hit from it, but there was a lot of controversy that he had a, some kind of cyanide pill, right? Or something that would he could have taken to end his own life before being captured. Is, is that right? That was a rumor. But it was never substantiated. No. Well, I remember it even, well, let's see, this that happened in what, 1961 or 60, 61 or 62, somewhere around there. And I remember as a child, it was very, throughout the nation, it was very controversial about why he didn't end his own life and all that, the rumor thereof. But uh, here he was treated very much as a hero. Yeah. But, uh, of course, there's always going to be a negative side to something somewhere. That, uh, well. Did you interview him when he came home? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, let me see how I can put it. You have the big city slickers, newspaper people, and they all come into these uneducated yeah. Southwest Virginia. <coughs> and they drew their own conclusions about us. And we, we probably look to them like Backwoodsy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we kind of laughed at them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now I would have fam I would think that Gary and his family would have talked to you with respect and and, oh, and, and that, let me they were kind of glad that you were local and somebody to tell it to. I tell you how how that worked. Uh, I. I went to the post office when I was working for the coal field. Right. And I went to the post office two times a, a, a day. And I had to go right by Oliver's shoe shop. And this was it was. Uh, Relatively, well, everybody knew everybody, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, Oliver, Oliver and I got to be real good friends. Well, now, his shoe shop was in Norton. Oh, yeah. Now, did he drive from the pound uh, to work every day? Yeah. Wow. That's tough. Yeah. As I were, wasn't that Gary's home up uh, off of uh, Mill Creek back through there? Yeah. And that was a pretty good trek to go to work all the time. Yeah. But that, uh, I can imagine the road wasn't nearly, well, I certainly <laughs> Indian Creek was uh, the main road, but uh, that would that'd take a, Lord, I guess that'd at least take a half hour, 45 minutes to get to work each day, from the, even from the pound. But, uh, but it was Oliver Powers was his father. And I remember, seems like that one of his sisters was working at the old Walmart not too many years ago, what's now Rule Key. And I remember running into her up there on that. What? Yeah, that was a big story, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. Kind of put, <clears throat> kind of put Watts County on the map. Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, Not always a good thing. Well, one of the more prominent people that came out of Wise County, also from the pound, was Napoleon Hill. Do you remember anything yeah. about? I, now he was long gone by the time you got to be an adult. But did he ever come back home or anything to, that you remember after he wrote his books? Yeah. That, uh... I, uh, 
I I wrote it. Uh, I wrote something about his book. It's the, you, that thing, I don't know how many times it's been in print. I know. I saw a thing uh, on PBS. Uh, you know, they're all the time got a fundraiser going on. And they were talking about how his book is still in print. And they interviewed uh, people up here with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. And there's so many people that use that as a guidebook in their own life. That uh, I was thinking about, uh, they got Napoleon Hill and uh, Gary Powers on that mural up there in the pound, and Roberts, Glenn Roberts Sr. and the Roberts Brothers. Now, yeah. I guess you watched them play ball, did you or not? Oh, yeah. Everybody watched them play ball. Mm. They, they were kind of a. A national celebrities. Yeah. Wow. Well, they did so well, and they were the professional ball players for Firestone. That's how the Firestone. Yeah, finished. and then when they got to retired, Firestone gave them those businesses. Well, I'll be. Uh, here's something else about Carl is, is uh, the. Pueblo crew was captured by North Korea. Right. Carl went to the Kremlin and got them released. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the International Lines paid for that too. And uh, little known. Yeah, well, uh, here's another one. Uh, Carl met with Ayatollah and got 53 people out of there. And the International. Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah. Now that was in uh, the Carter administration. I believe so. Right after Carter was defeated, I think Carl went over and took care of it. And it, here's something else that's kind of interesting: is uh, Carl represented uh, a, a plane crash for um, I can't think of his name right now, uh, but the plane crash killed. Uh, a uh, boy. Plane crash killed uh, one of the people that Carl represented the family or something? Represented, um, I can't think of the name right now, but I'll come to it later. But that's how Carl got involved with international uh, flight. They well, got, after the Gary Powers thing, or, or, uh, that kind of put him in the spotlight and the go-to guy for many occasions. Apparently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> Frank Sinatra's family, or Frank Sinatra hired Carl to represent him. His mother was killed in a plane crash. Oh, I'll be. Never had heard that one. Well, do you remember that, Bill? That, wow. That, uh. That, here's something else about the powers. Shifty powers. Right. Now, we're, now they must have been related. That's my understanding. Do you remember that about Shifty Powers? That uh, called, there was a movie called The Band of Brothers. That's that movie's been out twenty years or so, maybe longer than that now. Time gets by, and it was about these guys uh, in uh, World War Two in Europe, and they followed them all. Shifty was the sniper of the group. Yeah. And did you ever know Shifty Powers? He was, from, uh, he was. He He too was out of the pound, and I was never. Clinchco. Clinchco. Yeah. Okay. That uh, I was thinking the pound, but uh, now he hadn't been dead too many years. No. But Diane, do you remember that Band of Brothers movie? No, I don't. It was. It was so ironic. After it came out, I had never heard the story about Shifty, but it was a very prominent movie. Um, I, I guess it's 25 years ago, and it followed. And he was the first, one of the first ones to get enough points to come home after they had served over in World War II, and just an old mountain boy that uh, ended up right in the thick of it. And they, these guys, 
we've got so many people that have done, contributed so much to our country through here. Uh -huh. What was a, uh, uh, all of the uh, coal mining and that, that sort of thing, when the, the uh, fuel embargo hit in 73 and there were so many essentially overnight millionaires, did you cover much of that? or were you, I know you've about to been right in the thick of it. What do you remember about all of the coal boom of the 70s? I can remember going out and had to get fuel on uh, odd or even numbers of your gas or your license plate. Odd number you get it one day and even number you get it the next day. Uh, we used to joke about it. Uh, before this came along, we were the forgotten Virginia. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we were the most famous part of Virginia. When all this all that, yeah. And, and and people from all over the all over the world came in and trying to buy the coal and uh, it went from little to nothing for a ton. But you know what prompted all of that was the the price of the fuel, wasn't it? That uh, what was the cheapest you remember paying for a gallon of gas? I remember they had gas wars. I don't think I, I don't think I remember gas. That, uh, <laughs> I don't think I had a driver's license. What well, uh, the uh, cheapest I can remember is about twenty-five cents a gallon, and they have gas wars. Ever uh, like Exxon had uh, what was a tiger in your tank, and you get a tiger tail and hang it out of the trunk of your car, or, and Gulf had a uh, pair. Of uh, horseshoes that you stuck on the back of your car. Yeah. That uh, what was it? Put a kick in your put a kick in your tank or something like that. Every one of them had a little bit of different take yeah. on it. And of course, gas was cheap. Those gas wars, when the embargo hit, and it started going up to a dollar more than a dollar a gallon, nobody had a fuel pump or a gas pump that registered over a dollar. That, that changed a whole lot of things even at that. Uh, now somehow, I was working for Westmoreland at the time and they had their own, at the old Landover shopping center, they had their own fuel and you had to be an employee of Westmoreland to be able to buy fuel up there. And I, that was across the road from the town of Andover and I can remember getting in line and we were backed up all the way to the Derby turnoff, about three eighths of a mile up the road to get in the line for gas. I was in the same line. <laughs> <laughs> that, we didn't know how that was going to end up. No. But that's what prompted all of the, the cold boom. Ernie was telling me before we started talking about the people that came in here to get involved with all of the buying of the coal and different ones. Do you remember any of those folks' uh, names or any of the people that came in here to buy any of them or did you ever get to interview any of them or any of that? Ah, uh, yes. And no. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I remember coming in and all, but I can't remember the, yeah. the circumstances. They were uh, speculators, to say the least. Oh, yeah. That, uh, again, they're going to prey on us ignorant hillbillies and that, that sort of thing. Uh, doesn't history repeat itself? Kind of, doesn't it? You think about it. Sure does. Yep. More ways than one. <laughs> uh, that was the reason. You know, in the, in the drama, them, the old brother Dave, them foreigners coming in here trying to learn us how to run this place. <laughs> and a, a lot, a lot of merit to that statement. That uh, well, they let their imagination run crazy. 
with all that. <clears throat> Three fourths of it wasn't in one true. Well, now you were at, at uh, certainly in the thick of it during that flood of '77, and uh, the flood of '57. Did this much here in, in uh, our area? I know uh, Pound got hit hard in '57. Oh, yeah. Pound got hit worse than anybody. Now, you wouldn't have remembered too much about the flood of 37, but do you remember any about it? It seemed like it was on 20-year intervals there for a while. 37, I think, was much more up in Buchanan County. And then 57 was what it prompted them to build the Pound Dam. Yeah. And that was the salvation of the Pound come 77. But we're down here on... Uh, First Avenue East, just a, a little bit from us is Bullet Park, and I can remember it was about four foot of water on the book on the football field one there down there. I remember that. Were you getting worried about the house here? Yeah, the the water. If you look at the the gate down here, right. The water came up to the very foot of the gate. Right at the base of it. Right at the base of it, yeah. That's hard for us to imagine. And that's about which, which made it uh, about four and a half or five foot deep. At least, yeah. And Bullet Park. Well, thinking back about Bullet Park when were you at the singing convention when the swinging bridge fell? Oh yeah. Yeah, I was too. I broke the story. Did you? In the whole world. Mm. I, <laughs> I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. But, uh, I had been down with my dad. He was with the Kiwanis Club and they were having the hamburger stand down there feeding everybody. Lions Club had the other pavilion. And I was wore out, and I walked up. I was walking up the hill to my granddad's up at Poplar Hill, and I heard all the screaming and everything going on. It was I didn't know what was going on, but I was staying away from it. I went the other way, and that, of course, the tragedy of all of that. Was there two people killed in that, or uh, I don't remember. two or three of them died? Just overloaded the bridge, wasn't it? Yeah. And here we are now talking about putting another bridge in for the green belt. They're crossing over. The green belt's been one of the nicest things our towns had put in, hadn't it? Yeah. And so many people love it. They come from all over to walk it. I guess you put a few miles in on it over the years. Oh yeah. Where I grew you get, up in it. You grow up and you're meeting your neighbor and everybody out walking together or walking their dog. It's certainly been a wonderful asset for our family. Everybody knew everybody. Yeah. yeah. That uh, one time, well, of course, all of the wonderful houses here in town, and uh, the old uh, building, the Girl Scout cabin. I remember us going to a Halloween party over there. You and Jean uh, and I, that must have been in the early, mid-70s, I guess it was. 75, 76, somewhere yeah. along there. Yeah. And everybody was looking forward to you coming in. And that was a wonderful party. Everybody dressed up in costume. I went as myself. I shaved my beard and nobody knew who it was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Uh, I, I can't remember what you all were dressed up. I know that uh, somebody came as uh, Jaws. It was a big movie, not too far removed from the Jaws. time. Yeah, the, that shark thing. Nah. I think it was Annie Sutherland came in as uh, uh, paper mache jaws. <laughs> Everybody really got elaborate costumes for that. Yeah. Seems like there wasn't there a, a Chinese dragon of about four people made a Chinese dragon. A that so I thought. That was one year. <laughs> that little house has had a lot of memories. 
Oh, yeah. For a lot of people, not just the Girl Scouts. Yeah. About the Bullet Park, uh, Pappy always told me that, uh, that before they flew on Aviation Road, they flew out of Bullet Park with those old jennies, and some of them were scared to death fly sober. Said they'd take you up to five gallon of gas and a pint of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> then before that, I understand it was a five hole golf course. Did you ever have any pictures of it? I, I never have seen the the golf course. I thought maybe you had found some pictures of it somewhere. I, I think I did at the time, but I don't remember. Uh, Lord, that's been such a... Almost a hundred years ago. Yeah. And, you know, and today I wonder how, you know, they're always having a big championship game down here and playing ball with these schools far away. I wonder if the name Bullet Park is intimidating to them when they come in. <laughs> All the shootings and things going on. <laughs> Nobody knows. Out of, out of here would know how it got its name. I know. But, uh, well, they know how you got it. Man. Well, yeah, we do, but the the come here has had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it was Josh Bullet, wasn't it? Josh Bullet, and, uh, one of the founders of the coal industry, and, and it said that part of the golf course you had to walk across the bridge over at Aviation Road, and some of the holes were on the other side of the. Road. On the other side of the. So that swinging bridge had been there for quite some time. Or a bridge, and I don't know if it's the same one. Uh, could have been. And so I'm assuming that's how they got nine holes out of it. Like five on one side, yeah, and four, on, four the on the other. May have been. May have been. I'd love to see some pictures of that. That uh, you know, Garnet Gillum had so many pictures turned into him over the years. It it may be archived in that. Yeah. That. Uh, well, I get so much of our whole town revolved around Bullet Park. I know that that's where my dad played football, and uh, he grad. Well, his last football game would have been 1930, and uh, he graduated in '31. Uh, he was talking about said up here at the uh, intersection of uh, Fifth and Wood. This is after the dummy line had long since been gone. I think the dummy line last ran in 1919. But in 1930, in that intersection, the traffic light was on a concrete post in the center of the intersection. He said they came down from Appalachia in an old stake side Rio truck, carrying on and pooping it up, you know. Well, they took the turn too short. And I hung up, hung the truck up on that concrete post. And he said that there was a produce stand where Smitty's was, where now that double wide pharmacy is. And he said everybody started pelting them with eggs and cabbage and anything else they could get a hold of. So that rivalry had been going on for quite some time. Yeah. I guess all of that was. Who was the main rivalry with Norton? Wise? It was the what? Main rival, uh, school rival with Norton, I would imagine it had been Wise, was it? Or was it Big Stone or just uh, whoever, when you were going to school up there, uh, their big football game, which, who was the biggest football game that y'all had? Wise or Big Stone or Appalachia or? Wise. Yeah, I would Big paid. Stone. Just about equal. I like it. Those, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> you've got a good little friend right here. Yeah. <laughs> All energy. Oh, was another big event. Oh! Now, you were probably a reporter about the time that. Clara Lou Kelly came to Big Stone. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, she I, was a, she was something else. <laughs> Do you, did you write any about her getting the cows off the streets in Big Stone? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I always loved that story. Now, 
uh, newspaper reporter wrote something about uh, the only cow pasture in the world only, with the traffic. The only cow, cow pasture, electrically lighted <laughs> cow pasture. I'd love to see that article. Oh. She came to town with Creed, who was from here, right? Yeah. And he had found this very uh, sophisticated young lady in Knoxville. And they were wed. And she came to town and she said, the cattle need to be behind the fences, not the people. <laughs> For everybody had a fence around the yard. And it took her about three years to get this done, but she got the cattle off the streets. Well, everybody, it was a given. You know, you, you had your cows, it served a good function. It kept the streets grazed down to a reasonable manner. And, and I think that same newspaper article said it had to stop more often for the cows laying in the road than they did the traffic lights. Yeah. And, uh, and her father-in-law was the owner of one of the said cows. <laughs> but then she was also the lady that started the garden clubs. That what? Started garden clubs. She started the Dogwood Garden Club. Yeah. Of which my mother was a charter member. And I guess it must have been about six well it had to be it was in sixty two. By this time she had started about four garden clubs. One begat another. And the Valley Garden Club, the Intermont, and I can't remember what the fourth one was. But they had this Christmas flower show in the old Big Stone Gap School gym. And it filled the whole gymnasium. My dad and I had to go out and cut the cedar trees for the four main Christmas trees. Earlier that fall, fellow by the name of Virgil Q. Wax. I know you and you remember Virgil. Oh yeah, I knew Virgil real well. Did you ever go on riding around with him? And yeah. it, he had that television program, yeah. Virgil Q. Varieties. Well, he had talked to Pappy sometime in the fall of 62 and told him that uh, there was a group down in Kentucky that was going to wanting to put on an outdoor drama about John Fox's Trail of the Lonesome Pine. He said, now that thing needs to be in Big Stone. Well, that was the first that knew of anybody even interested in doing so. And Pappy had said on that. And I can remember so well, Clara Lou, she was just busting at the seams, proud of that flower show filling the gymnasium. <laughs> and she said, I, uh, I've i got to find something that I can get involved in and sink my teeth into it. And I can remember my mother telling Pappy, tell her about it, tell her about it. <laughs> that, uh, but getting the drama, getting the Lone Spine Arts and Crafts started. Now you were in on that that ground floor of that too. Yeah. That, uh, that like I say, that was an, the weekend, first weekend of December of 62, and by April of 63, you all had gotten the incorporation of Lost and Pine Arts and Crafts. Do you remember much about doing all of that? No. That, uh, My memory's gone. Well, now sometimes it gets stirred up a little yeah. bit. Now, that's what I hope we can do here. That uh, the Fox sisters were still alive. What was it, Miss Elizabeth? Minnie. Minnie. Minnie and Miss Elizabeth. Yeah. They were still living, and they were so upset with the Hollywood version of the book. See, by this time, it made into a movie three times. Twice during the silent era, and then in 1937, it was the first movie made in Technicolor. And I've seen two, two of the three versions, none of which had anything to do with the book. Uh, they wanted to, just about had to sign an affidavit 
that they'd stay right by the script that was written. And I don't know, Diane, was Gene one of the prompters at that time? Do yeah. you remember? She did it for years. I yeah, know, yeah, on yeah. either side it was uh, Gene and uh, Nancy Bell were on either side and they'd go through page by page on the script making sure that nobody including Tommy Master yeah. said anything that was not in the script. Tom, <laughs> Tommy was hard of hearing in any way. And you never knew what was coming out of it. I but. know and then I can remember the, the plainest day there Tommy said that. What'd you say, Jane? <laughs> that was one of the community plays that they did. Oh, yeah. And she always prompted for those, too. Well, now, one time and she did more of prompting. Yes, I can remember her being the fiddler on Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got some pictures of her playing that fiddle. That was, that was, that was my biggest memory of that production, her playing that. You know, that, there was a lot of talent in those days. And yeah. That uh, put on those big productions and that carried forward. Big Stone had a memory. Well, then, yeah, that. I remember in two plays. Uh, Don Baker. Was it Don Baker? The one that, uh, from Norton? Yeah, Don. He did, uh, he went on and he became a director up at, uh, Lime Hill Theater at Lexington. But he wrote a couple of plays and he used this line in both of them. Ain't it peculiar how people in the valley look down on people up in the mountain? <laughs> a, a direct reference to how Norton and Wise felt about Big Stone mm. people. Now, Ernie, do you remember any of the feedback from all of that, uh, of that attitude? I remember the same, but I... And that, uh, well, this was where the foreman of the guard had been, and the aristocracy, such as it was, was down here in Big Stone. And the... the there was an attitude that Big Stone felt like it was better than everybody else. Yeah. yeah. And I lived in Norton. Yeah. It, well, you eventually moved to Big Stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, did you feel that, that way? Yeah. Or, that a bunch of snobs, well, he got the golf course down there. I went from snob to hero. <laughs> there you go. But also, you got to remember, though, Westmoreland Coal Company controlled most of this area here. Wise didn't have any. So he didn't, didn't have any big company like Westmoreland. Also, is in a trail on some time, the people on Big Stone hired a hundred deputies. Yeah, the, the foreman of the guard and all of that. Yeah, and they were up there when uh, uh, Red Fox was hanged and and. Uh, well, of course, he, he wouldn't hunt hung, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another day. That time. I, I agree with you. On but that. you know, one of the one of the guards was uh, John Fox Jr. He was a guard at the Horace jail. Fox was too. Was in that police thing. Yeah, and the police guard. That uh, yeah. Uh, but there was a certain aura about the residents of Big Stone felt by the whole region, wasn't it? That that uh, and that that persisted. I don't think it's that, it's not prevalent like that now. I think uh, people... Oh no, it, it's a different... But it, that carried over for two or three generations. That, uh, and like you say, a lot of it started with the foreman of the guard, the coming of law and order, and all of that, but it continued on over until Westmoreland or Stonega Coke and Coal. You know, there's another place that's just about like us, is Bramble, West Virginia and Pocahontas, Virginia. The money up there, where our money came from to 
boost up the coal was from Philadelphia. Their money came from New York, and they built a Monopra house. And, uh, you know, the dignitary and the culture <laughs> of the opera was presented before the workers. And I've been in it. Yeah. And it's they're trying to refurbish it now. But you remember the term being in the limelight? The orifices are still there where they pumped up to burn the lights for the foot stage. Yeah. That, that, uh, and Bramble, it was a whole lot more than Big Stone ever thought about being as far as being aloof and aristocratic. There was more millionaires up there per capita than any other town in the country. That uh, they had, at one time I heard that they had Instead of a B for Bramble, they had a dollar sign on their jerseys for the basketball team at the high school. <laughs> so we weren't as arrogant as some of the others could have been, you know. That, uh, but it, that did bring a lot, a lot to the town. Isn't there a story that maybe be in the book that he wrote? I'm not sure about of all the people that came in and stayed. The majority of them, or a huge number of them, the town leaders were all college edu educated. No, I am not. That they, the people that came in, like the Foxes and I don't know other people, yeah. not the original originals, but a lot of those people that came in during the coal boom were all outsiders with college education. You talk about the original boom back in the 1890s, right? And maybe that's kind of where that the it other swelled up. Yeah. Wise didn't have a boom like that that no. I know of. Norton did a little because of the trains, but it it was different. At least that's my interpretation. I don't know. That could well, very well been a, a big factor in it. Uh, well, even with John Fox, Fritzy Chef coming in for whatever time she stayed down here. Yeah, there was. I remember hearing stories about them going from house to house, like from the, here to, say, the heir's house up there. It said that it had servants delivering invitations to afternoon teas on silver trays going from around. I've, I've always heard that through the mm -hmm. people at the Fox House. Pat Bean. Do what? Pat Bean. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and she, and she was telling about the, all, all of that. I miss Pat. That time. Well, I've got another story to ask about. The Korean War veteran from Cracker's Neck up here, he, I think, enlisted when he was like 16 or something and got over there and got captured. And then uh, he had, a, he got captured he got out of the prison in North Korea and he got captured again. And then he was supposed to be one of the 23 people from the United States said they want to stay in North Korea. And they said turn right and he turned left and escaped again. And he was a hero in this country. They had ticker tape parades in New York and all over the place. and. Uh, uh, he came, there were news people from all over the country came to Cracker's Neck to talk to him. Yeah. I don't remember what his name was right Ed now. Dickinson. Yeah. What? Ed Dickinson. Ed Dickinson. Yeah. yeah. And I worked with his son. Now, he, right. He was, he was defamed in many ways. Yeah. Uh, away from here. Because they felt like that he was a traitor or portrayed as such. And it was not as you say, he, he escaped and everything. That, uh, yeah, that was a pretty rough time for that, that fella. Oh, well, that, the, uh, that family suffered. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, Our government, pro government prosecuted him considerably. He had a job over at the Stone Quarry, and the FBI came in and said, you can't work here, and they're going to fire you because you're handling explosives. And the only thing he did, as far as we can tell, he had a raw potato when he was captured the last time. 
And they said, what are you doing? I, I want to eat it if I have to. They got here for helping with the enemy, saying he had a raw potato. And after all that, then they sent him to prison after he's back here. And before, I could tell Diane's not heard this story. I have not. Uh, well, I was working with Carl McAfee at the time. He came up to Carl's office, and he had three different kinds of cancers. And he said, I might have my name straightened out before I die. And Carl said, let's see what we can do. Uh, he called the President of the United States, Carl did. Uh, Carl, uh, friends. And uh, he said, I'll give him a presidential pardon. And he said, Dickinson said, I don't want no damn presidential pardon. I want my name cleared. So we worked on that for some time. And there's a guy that was in the prison camp with him in uh, Kentucky. And Carl wanted me to go up and talk to him. I said, well, you've got more inf information than I do. He said, well, don't you know anybody up there? And I said, yeah. Is, uh, I know the uh, delegate from up there, Billy Ray Cyrus's dad. Huh. I went up and talked to him. And uh, I told him who the name of the person was. Where he said, I don't know him. He must be a Republican. <laughs> but he made arrangements. We went over and talked to him. But he got 95% uh, disability, and he didn't want to be on record about anything. So he wouldn't let us videotape and record him, but he said Ed did not do anything that anybody else didn't do, just trying to survive. But yeah. he, was, he was afraid they'd take his benefits away if he told what really went on. And then we got, talked to several other people, uh, head of the uh, military, disability people and all and they said that is sad we need to do something about that but he died before we could do anything about it and it took money to do all this stuff yeah and the yeah. family didn't have any money uh yeah as i say i worked with his son in the mines and i never did really talk to him about it much i didn't know how open up old wounds yeah uh, you know, that was so sad. Yeah, well, I got him on video. I oh, video touched that's, him. That's great. Uh, that's that, awesome. that, you know, to, for him to be in any way vindicated was so sad. Yeah. So, so sad. Well, here's all the veterans associations were behind him 100%, but they couldn't get anybody else besides this area to help him. Well, it's so hard to unring a bell. That uh, once that was done, of course I was I was too young to know anything about it of the time. You know, in the later years I heard about it. It was his family that uh, built our house, uh, and they were so proud of, of building that and construction of those. I guess it might have been his older brothers, maybe even his father, that uh, built that. But oh, there were good and bad stories about our area. And, mm -hmm. no, oh yeah. That uh, what were some of the most uplifting things that you can remember about your reporter days? Did we have any any presidents come here or anything like that? Uh, campaigning or any? I don't remember anything. I think I do remember Nixon coming up to the Wise Airport some during his running, but I don't remember anybody else. Oh, George Dalton had a picture about everybody coming and going when he was a reporter for the Bristol. At the in Kingsport. Yeah. No, no. Well, did he do much reporting, or was he more of the photographer for him, or? Mostly reporting. Okay. I remember he was submitting uh, news feed to WCYB and they were carrying it by bus, whatever he filmed. And uh, yeah. a friend of mine was working for WCYB. It was Chuck Tipton. He really, he, uh, as a young kid, he lived out the road from us there. And uh, 
family moved to Bristol when he was about 13. And he got a job with WCYB, and part of his job was to go to the bus station every day to see if there was anything from George Dalton down here for bringing in the film of the whatever happened. Communication's a lot different today. Isn't oh, it? gosh, yeah. They talk it's about your mother funny. being the operator. And did you ever think that you'd look at your phone to see what time it is or go to the... <laughs> No, I, I was in on that. My mother was the uh, uh, chief operator. Now that was in Norton. In Norton. Yeah. Yeah. So we lived. We lived a lot of that. Do you remember your phone number? Six O. Six O. <laughs> Ours was one eight four J. I remember that very well. And then they would change them because it went you first you'd pick up and say, Hey Granny, you let me speak to Marsha and she would connect you. And then the next thing was you push a button or two or a dial and then it kept the numbers kept getting bigger and bigger, but she she could still hear you when you would talk. So Granny knew everything in town. <laughs> yeah, they, that was, uh, well, uh, Westmoreland, even, I, was it, in, I think the uh, zip codes came about in 63, was that right? And about the same time that we went digitally, well, it must have been, I guess it was 65, when we got uh, seven number, somewhere around there. She had re I think she had retired by that time. No, I don't know. She was there for like 50 some years. Wow. Yeah. I can remember the old telephone lines, old Bear Copper. And they went across our place and Bear Copper wire on glass insulator. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, was that when the uh, operators had their place above what used to be Parks Belt there? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. One interesting thing, there were a lot of great looking ladies that worked in there. <laughs> and if you were out sometime and needed a date, you'd call the operator and yeah, we'll be down. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> That's funny. That's My mother was one of them. <laughs> See so much change in one lifetime. It yeah. Just. But speaking of what, my dad was born in Hungary. In where? Hungary, and he could speak six different languages fluently. And wow. He had a degree in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. He was a doctor. He was a surgeon. He was a commander in World War Two. Yeah. But he can remember the first car that he ever saw and a man landing on the moon in one lifetime. I mean, that, that, That's mind boggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we've become so complacent about all of these things and to see, really just think about the roads, how Pappy said that to get from here to Jasper, he had to cross the railroad track nine times <laughs> on old dirt roads. And they, uh, he was 12 when they started building the house. And my granddad said they wanted him to learn to work and he'd be on part of the house. They put him behind a horse with an old scoop digging out the basement it was like a big shovel and had to bow down on it. To, or pick up on it and they dig in and bow down to get your load. He said if he can do a man's day's work, he can work with us. Then they put him on a T-model pickup, hauling all the lumber up from the depot in the southern. That, uh, of course, like I say, the dummy line was long gone before you got into the world, but you've seen plenty of pictures of it. Yeah. That, uh, that I thought that that was a, very unique name, the dummy line, 
But I come to find out that there were many dummy lines. It was kind of of a term for a spur line going off to serve a community, I reckon. Yeah. Let me tell you something else. That, uh, my dad worked in the coal mines when he was a kid with his dad. And he decided he needed a better education. So that's how come he did all that stuff. But after World War II, uh, he saw in a medical journal that Dr. Short, Short's Clinic, which later became St. Mary's, needed a doctor. So he came down here and Dr. Short hired him. I remember Dr. Short. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And uh, after working with Dr. Short, and they were working with all the different coal companies, my dad decided they needed a coal company. They needed a, a hospital here. And the estate behind Home Hardware was the Fleming Estate, and it was for sale for $50,000, I believe. My dad put 5000 down, didn't think he'd have any problem getting money from the banks. He didn't know that the banks were controlled by the coal companies, <laughs> and the coal companies did not want a hospital because they didn't want to pay that bill. So it was, uh, after, he had 90 days to pick up that other $45,000, and that's big deal back after World War II. Uh, so he went to John L. Lewis and got a personal loan from John L. Lewis for $45,000 to build the Norton Community Hospital. But it was the miners' hospital first because the miners put up the money for it. Yeah. And, and they didn't have enough money to buy coal for the hospital. But so behind the hospital, they were digging out for the parking lot and they hit a five foot seam of coal. They used the coal out of the parking lot to heat the hospital. Was that the one up on the hill? Yeah, and okay. Thompson Litton, they had just left Westmoreland and they did the engineering free for that. And uh, Charlie Daniels did the plumbing. He just got out of the Korean War and that's what he did. They taught him how to be a plumber in the Korean War and that was his first big contract too. Mm -hmm. It's a cool story. Bill, I, it's good. Yeah. It, do you agree with that, Bill? Yeah. What? Yeah, do you remember that story about the building and the uh, hospital in Norton and how it was miners and all of that after the Korean War that paid for it? He said got, his dad got uh, John L. Lewis to help fund part of yeah. it. Yeah. That, uh, hey, I sure appreciate the time with you. Maybe we could continue this. I don't want to wear you out. That, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Jack, you talk, I, I'm sorry, I want to interject. You talked about the differences in life from like when he was born to now. And, you know, when that man was born, he weighed three and a half pounds wow. in 1928. And they wrapped him in a blanket at the hospital and sent him home to keep him warm. He's not going to make it. Three and a half pounds. Wow. <laughs> kind of stretched that three and a half pound out over the oh, years. Yeah. <laughs> but a three and a half pounder now, think about happen, what would happen to a baby now at three and a half pounds, you know? And it's just, it's like night and day, the differences. But that man made it. <laughs> yes, and quite well, good sir. Yeah. Precious memories. Well, it is, and it, it you did you've been so much part of it, and I can remember you back there with the drama and how much you were so much part of it that I feel like it's an honor to be with you. Well, it I think so much, and then I think back. In the church, us sitting behind in the pew behind you, and all those years there, as you say, precious memories that I hope that we can preserve for Diane's children and everybody else's, and really for our whole area. That these young people don't think too much about this, and I think you just have to live several years before it really means something yeah. to you. That, uh, I've often thought. Uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm sure I'm the only one left with the memories. So. Yeah, uh, but well now they're, they're, it's getting fewer and fewer and every generation has got another group yeah. to come about. But they didn't have the ability and the equipment to record a lot of these in these earlier days. It all had to be left uh, maybe a still photograph and a written down somewhere, but that, this is, I remember what little bit of recording I've got of my dad and hearing his voice is just so refreshing. And maybe we can preserve this this afternoon. What are we? August of 2022. And uh, maybe several generations or years later, people look back on this with nostalgia. <laughs> and I know I already am. Bill, thank you for the this opportunity, sir. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I thank you too. Appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's uh, who was that one time? Somebody said something about. Well, all you people back in the mountains, and somebody else said, "Yeah, but they weren't all related." Yeah, yeah. Not so much as it. Uh, yeah. We have been betrayed bitterly in so many ways. But you have certainly put on a lot of people who had influence on many things in this world. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so Dad, many. You, you should tell Jack your little story. You know that Dad tells things all the time sitting in here about your name, about Mama calls me. Do you remember it? Mother calls me William. I'm sorry. Is it? Mother calls me William. Your mother called you William? Yeah. And well, you said a while ago that you didn't like that term Billy. <laughs> no. he, he says that he has has this thing. I don't know if he made it up or not. It says, Mother calls me William. Sister calls me William. Well, Father calls me... Really? But your brothers call me Bill. <laughs> yep. That, uh, I can relate to you about that Billy thing. I, <laughs> I hated that, that term Jackie. It didn't bother me too bad until I started getting they old Miss Jackie McClanahan. There you know that. Now that 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 oh that didn't go down well at all. And then there's so many folks that that was all they knew me by. Thank heaven that this uh, name Jack Mac stuck. And I, I think I give credit to that to Bob Lyle. He was the one that got all that started. But that was kind of unique and. Uh, been my moniker for many years. That, uh, well, that's all I've ever known you as. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll continue this another day. I don't want to wear you out, honey. I and, enjoyed every minute of that. Well, we'll, we'll try, try to do another session. <laughs> all right? Yeah. That would be good with me. But think about things that Diane helped him out and think about things that prompt him to because there's so many questions. Thank heaven's already brought up a bunch of things that... Uh, Diane's awful good about helping me remember. Well, yeah, and then prompting your stories that she's heard that you will bring forth on all of this. Uh -huh. that, uh, I didn't know that about the house. I, I, that, that's fascinating. This one you mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, every once in a while, I, I, I sit out here a lot on the porch and I look at some of those boards yeah, and yeah. I thought if, it, if they could just talk. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I wonder how old is the wisteria on the house? It's got to be over a hundred. Really? Every window is the original window. If you look at these That is glass, amazing. It's, that uh, is amazing. And the, the foundation, it's that white. Now is it rock or is it brick? Awesome. Concrete. 
Oh, what wonderful like, craftsmen they had. Now the basement is only, like I even have to kind of duck a little bit um, in most of it. There's a couple ropes that are I can stand up in, but they don't build them like that anymore. What was the heating? Was it a uh, radiator? Yeah, it was cold when we were cold. growing up. Cold with radiator or hot air? We were going down and stoking it hot before air. I'd go to school. Okay. So, Ours was radiator. And, uh, well, that's what it is. It was. Radiator? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're yeah. still in there. I mean, there's one right there behind you. It, they're not in use. Yeah, we took ours out. When yeah. we, and and uh, my mother had them stacked up with stuff all over them, using them for first one thing and another even when they were functional. Wonder how the heat got out of there. But uh, this heat was always I mean this house was always warm. I mean Yeah, yeah we never the cold we, we never suffered at all and then uh, uh, we uh, didn't know how how bad we were at all <laughs> until they told us. Yeah. yeah. Well you know I think back about of course at our place we had everything on that except a sheep and a mule at one time or another. Ponies, cattle, hogs, chickens, pheasants, turkeys, guineas, and then a tremendous garden. Well, my mother, that was, aside from getting volunteers to work at the Oliver house, she was staying home, she didn't drive. And I can remember many a night going home after the drama stringing beans to one o'clock in the morning after we got home about 11.30 yeah. or so. And then her cannon all the next day. I don't know how in the world we did all that. Pappy working, and it was just, now. Just a way of life. Well it was, but you know, the, the thing I remember that you go to church, and people had time to visit with one another and sitting on get some serious pork setting done on Sunday afternoon with friends and all that. Now if you go to church you're lucky you'd feel like you got by McDonald's in the afternoon, you know the television. We, well we all stand in front of a microwave and all are hurry. Think about what all the dinner preparation was and my mother always took Sunday afternoon for the Tolliver house to have it open by two o'clock. Yeah. And to get home from church and prepare a meal, she'd sort of started it before we went to church. Do you rem You all remember the big days of the singing convention here? Oh. Oh yeah. Did you ever find the kids sleeping on the porch or anything when you came home from church? I remember different ones talking about. Ben Spive, he was always talking about kids and trying to get in his house and sleeping on the porch down there at his house. <laughs> I don't remember that. But Mom wasn't real fond of that kind of music. Yeah. The, the twang and everything. So we would often go away for the weekend. Ah, okay. Mom was, Mom was a little... Uh, well, I, I she liked have, music, but not gospel and... The way it was done there. Down there. Yeah, I can remember them coming in, loaded up in the pickups, and mm -hmm. coming in, uh, some of them in lawn chair. But, uh, I mean, when we were home, we would go, you know. But a lot of years, we weren't there. <laughs> well, I don't even reckon... You know, it was, was in its heyday, I guess. 50s and the 60s, and then it just kind of waned. And there was an effort to revive it there at one time, but I. Well, it's like everything. There is a. When it's hard to imagine now that it was uh, at the drama in those early years, full house, 700 people in there. Can't imagine that now. But you remember when they were hanging out the windows and everything else when we were doing the drama now. If you get 150 people, it's a big night. Okay. One thing I can remember, for some reason or another, was standing uh, 
right in the middle of Pine Knob Lake. And the next night, it was gone. You were standing on the bottom. I, 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 thought, I tell everybody I was the last one on it. Before what? they filled it up. Yeah. yeah. He also has a story of swimming, and he was so skinny. How cold. <laughs> I remember swimming up there as a child. I'm, you probably do too. And it was cold up there. Yeah. And Dad, you going you want to tell Jack Mike that story? Uh. The story you that. told me about a week ago. About you being thin and swimming. You were so cold. Yeah. And there was a platform out there. I only weighed two pounds when I was born. <laughs> two pounds. I guess they used to and do some skinny dipping up there at the knob. They told me that the, the doctor told her that I wasn't going to live. You made the fool out of him, oh, didn't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I never was up. I remember a few times up to High Knob Lake. But moreover, we would go to the Valley Lake, and they had that platform out in the middle of that that people would swim yeah. out there to that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the place when and I was very young. Roller skating rink was out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to remember this was our environment. Yeah, it sure was. It's, and it was mighty, mighty. Growing up my time, the country boy was the, the place to, to go. And the generation prior to that was car mines down there. And Carl, Mary Molly, and Pat. I remember he had this sign up that said, uh, T-Bone, 50 cents, with beat, $2 extra. <laughs> <laughs> I had the cash register there for a while. I don't know what happened to the, I, I hope, I wish that Pat would have given them somebody the five paintings that uh, Wayman Callahan had done. Maybe it was four of them. Are they in Pat's house? I don't know where they are. Uh, he had them in the basement, but they were so preserved because of all that grease on them. Do you remember seeing them? I don't remember. What? What was that? The uh, paintings that Wayman Callahan had done that hung in car mines. One was a football player, a basketball player, a uh, baseball, and a cheerleader. And those were, oh, they were. So they didn't so, burn when they had the fire? No, he had them out. And he had them rolled up. Okay. But uh, Wayman was a pretty renowned artist that uh, he had painted them. And of course, that was the, the hangout. And my cousins, uh, they lived. Well, they walked, and they, they were a meager means of uh, the hills. Danny, and uh, I don't know which ones you might remember, but they, uh, the boys, last, uh, Danny was still in his mother's arms when her dad passed away. And on Friday night, they had a special, you can get 10 chili buns for a dollar, and they were so going down to car mines and doing that, you know. But people at uh, high school, uh, lunch at the high school was, I think was a quarter, but they'd go down to get uh, to, uh, to car mines and get something to eat for lunch. They, they permitted that, certain ones. Of course, I guess a lot of them walked home and walked to lunch. Well, we're going to have to continue this another time. But uh, I hope that we can do so. Me uh, too. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a long time needed. Uh, what we call the good old days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to the folks today, these will be good old days to them for the yeah. young people. Yeah. It's so what you remember with. No, you Thank want to sign people. out and. Tell who else here? Oh, okay. Uh, Jack Mack with Mr. Bill Hendrick, the daughter Diane, Ernie Binko. This is a wonderful afternoon 
sitting here on East First Street in the shade of the wisteria that's over a hundred years old on Bill's front porch. Yeah. Signing out for now, but we're going to continue it on, all right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs>